And the message today, when shall the kingdom come? During recent weeks, we've been dealing with my book, Discover the Power Within You. What the book says in a nutshell is that you can be what you want to be and do what you need to do, that you can rise above any challenge and find healing in any illness because you are a spiritual being, because you are a whole creature with the power of God within you. This is the message, I believe, that Jesus taught. It's ages old, but it's ever new since it's really been understood and applied. And though Jesus taught this message, the church that has sprung up in his name has been so preoccupied with what I call the religion about Jesus that it has missed the religion of Jesus. Preachers have emphasized the divinity of Jesus. I insist that Jesus taught and demonstrated the divinity of man. Great stress has been on the miracles Jesus wrought, but seldom do we hear his clear perspective where he says, all these things that I do, you can do too, if you have faith. Now, one of the most misunderstood of Jesus' teachings concerns the kingdom of heaven. Jesus makes 113 references to it in the Gospels, so it is the single most referred to idea in all of his teachings. The disciples thought Jesus was referring to a political kingdom, but when that takeover of the system of his day did not occur, Theologians gradually evolved the idea of the place in the skies where we go when we die. So a whole system of thought has evolved around this. The word eschatology, which is a $75 word if there ever was one, deals with the doctrine of final judgment, the future state, the second coming of Christ, and millions of people have hopefully or fearfully looked for an event to happen and signs proclaiming that the end is near, the roll is called up yonder, and up we go to that final day. Preachers have talked of golden streets and harps and white robes and billowy clouds as things to look forward to in the kingdom of heaven. But now what did Jesus have to say about it? Actually, he was very clear about it. In the 17th chapter of Luke, he says, And being asked by the Pharisees, When the kingdom of God cometh, he answered, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo, here or there, for lo, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. Now, he's not talking about a place to which we go. It has nothing to do with futurity, for the only time is now. If it is within you, it must be within you now. It is not somewhere to go. It is something to be. In one of the apocryphal books of the New Testament, the disciples asked, When shall the kingdom come? And he answered, When the without shall become as the within. In other words, when you become an expression what you were created to be, or from the worldview, when the race of man is elevated to the level of universal perfection. Now, it's beyond imagination, for there's so much apparent evil in the world. You may recall the story of the young lad who was accosted by a minister who said, Sonny boy, who made you? And the boy replied, Well, to tell you the truth, sir, I ain't done yet. And that is the truth about you and you and you. You are not done yet. No matter what may be the level of your experience, there's more in you, there's more to come, you're not through. So the word heaven comes from the Greek word uranos, O-U-R-A-N-O-S, uranos, which literally means expanding. So the kingdom of heaven is the principle of expansion. The very nature of life is growth. This is why Jesus, in trying to explain the kingdom of heaven, used such illustrations as a sower goes forth to sow, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a mustard seed, the little leaven that leaveneth the lump, and so forth. Now, a strange lot of illustrations if he's talking about a place off there in the skies somewhere to which we go. Life is growth and unfoldment, and life is lived from within out. How few people really know this. The average person lives his life from the outside, at the circumference of experience. He lives from outside in. He completely frustrates his potential when he lets his level of consciousness be determined by what people say, by what conditions appear to be, what he reads in the papers, and what happens out there. He becomes little more than a barometer registering the conditions of the world instead of being what we might call a thermostat, controlling and regulating conditions themselves. Jesus came declaring, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, it really doesn't matter what happens around you. It doesn't really matter what happens to you. The only things that count are the things that happen in you. The other things are things in the world, and you can overcome the world. But what matters is what happens in you, your thoughts about conditions and people, 
and you can control your thoughts because you are the master of your mind, or you can be. After all, it is your mind. It's no one else's. It's your mind, and you can control it. And ultimately, that's exactly what we must do. Jesus recognized that the greatest foe of the idea of the kingdom of heaven as inner potential is Phariseeism. The Pharisees symbolized preoccupation with externals, with what I call custom-made convictions. He said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut the kingdom of heaven against men. And to most persons, religion is synonymous with the church service. It's a spectacle to witness, it's a ritual to employ, a prayer book to use once a week. So religion for many persons becomes what some have called a badge of conventional respectability. In other words, belonging to the right kind of church is quite often more important than being the right kind of person. Actually, the church should be a place of learning, a place to discover and research the potential within. But like any place of learning, the church, in a very real sense, should be forever trying to put itself out of business, to make itself progressively unnecessary. That's one of the things that people hear me say they get very upset about. I don't mean that there's anything wrong with the church. I mean that the church is a teaching organization. It should not be making people totally dependent upon the church, but making them dependent upon the spirit within themselves. In the book of Revelation, the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, and I saw no temple therein. An amazing insight from the book of Revelation. The holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, and I saw no temple therein. In other words, the vision of the future reveals a God-inhabited society of God-intoxicated people. This doesn't put down the church. Actually, it gives it a whole new objective. The old idea placed emphasis on the church. No matter what happens to the world, save the church. We must know that the church exists only as an instrument to motivate people to stir up their innate spiritual power by which they in turn may save the world. Every person must become a peacemaker, an influence for peace among men. Christians talk of being saved. I say, saved for what or from what? The implication is usually given that if the person is saved from the rest of the evil world, but no one can be saved from society. He must be saved with society, if at all, because he is society. And society is him. Herbert Spencer once says, No one can be perfectly moral until all are moral. No one can be perfectly free until all are free. No one can be perfectly happy until all are happy. When we begin to treat people individually and in, in groups as spiritual beings, saluting the divinity within them, then we will give and receive and do business on the level of love and mutual trust. We will begin to expect far more of ourselves than of others, and we will treat people as if they already were what our faith reveals they can be. Thus, we will become an influence for good in the world. One of the heartwarming stories coming out of the darkness of Nazi terror in the war, Second World War, is the story of Philippe Vernier, who was subjected to just about every form of indignity because he was a man of peace. As they say, he rotted in prison, and his family were harassed and starved. But he had awakened to the dynamics of the kingdom within, and none of these things had any influence on his faith. An American officer who called on him after the war reported that the visit with this great soul was the greatest inspiration of his life. I'd like to quote some words from a letter by Philippe Vignier. He says, If you're a disciple of the Master, it is up to you to illumine the earth. You do not have to groan over everything the world lacks. You are there to bring it what it needs. There will reign hatred, malice, and discord. You will put love, pardon, and peace. For lying, you will bring truth. For despair, hope. For doubt, faith. There where is sadness, you will give joy. If you are in the smallest degree the servant of God, all these virtues of light you will carry with you. Do not be frightened by a mission so vast. It is not really you who are charged with the fulfillment of it. You are only the torchbearer. The fire, even if it burns within you, even when it burns you, is never lit by you. It uses you as it uses the oil in the lamp. You hold it, feed it, carry it around, but it is the fire that works, that gives light to the world and to yourself at the same time. Do not be the clogged lantern that chokes and smothers the light, the lamp timid or ashamed, hidden under a bushel. Flame up and shine before men. Lift high the fire of God. Tremendous realization. You don't have to fret over what the world lacks. Flame up and shine. As Jesus said, in the world you have tribulation, but I have overcome the world. 
In other words, meet life on a higher level of consciousness. The great sin of mankind is not to know the divinity that lies unexpressed within every person. Perhaps the millennium that man has looked forward to must come to individuals one by one. And the time is now. Make the great discovery for yourself, the knowledge of the divine potential within. Namaskar. This is the Hindustani word that I've used throughout this book. Namaskar. Behold yourself in a mirror and say, Namaskar. The word means the divinity within me salutes the divinity within you. Namaskar. And then go out and act the part. Behold the people of your world, your friends, your neighbors, your enemies and strangers. Namaskar. And then treat them as if they are what they should be. No matter where you are in life, no matter what you may be experiencing, no matter how many heartaches you have had, there is more in you. There's a divinity in you. The very kingdom of God is within you. You can release your potential because Jesus proved that you have it and that you can release it. And this is what Jesus really taught.